been in the summer of Psalms, Psalms. So I want to look at Hebrews and 1 Samuel today. <laughs> Um, we're going to look at a narrative. I'm going to make it work. We're going to look at a narrative in 1 Samuel, and we'll connect Hebrews to it, because without a doubt, David was the greatest psalmist, the greatest psalmist. And there's a narrative, there's an episode in his life uh, that I want to share something from, and I have to preach this message to myself at least once a month. And so I figure if I need it, somebody else needs it, and I believe it's going to bless you today. So go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. When you're ready to read it, say yeah. yeah. If you're not ready and you're trying to find it on your smart device, but it's, it's struggling to load, say hold up. <laughs> Come on, it's, it's nerve-wracking when you can't find it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, we'll start at verse number one. And it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. What an awesome thought to consider that God has set a race before each and every one of us, and we are required to run that race. How do we do it? The writer of Hebrews tells us we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Can you say amen? amen? And then 1 Samuel 18, I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's message translation. And it says, whatever Saul gave David to do, he did it and did it well. So well that Saul put him in charge of his military operations. Everybody, both the people in general and Saul's servants, approved of and admired David's leadership. As they returned home after David had killed the Philistine, the women poured out of all of the villages of Israel, singing and dancing, welcoming King Saul with tambourines, festive songs, and lutes. I'm not really sure what a lute is, but I'm assuming it's like a flute without the F. And, <laughs> profound, I know. <laughs> And then it says, in playful frolic, in playful frolic. That made me laugh because you know it's a party when people are actually taking the time to frolic, okay? <laughs> in playful frolic, the women sang, listen to what they sang, Saul kills by the thousand, David by the ten thousand. Ooh, this made Saul angry, very angry. He took it as a personal insult. He said, huh. They credit David with ten thousands, but me with only thousands. Before you know it, they'll be giving him the kingdom. And from that moment on, Saul kept his eye on David. Ooh, I don't want to preach before I preach, so don't count this as my preaching time. But, but I do want us just for a moment to see these two passages of Scripture in parallel. Because here you have the writer of Hebrews who says, hey, there's a race that's been said before each and every one of us, and we run the race by keeping our eyes on who? On Jesus. But here we have Saul, because of a comparison that these ladies made between him and David, no longer is Saul focused on his race or his assignment, but comparison is so strong. It caused Saul to focus all of his attention, all of his energy on David. I want to preach today, not long, probably about six and a half hours. Just, uh, just using this as a title. This is my title, On Their Mark. If you're a note taker, that's my title today, On Their Mark. I realize when you're running a race, they say get on your mark. But I'm finding many people cannot run the race God has set before them simply because they have their eyes on the people in the lanes beside them. So instead of being on your mark, you're on there, Mark, this is going to be good in here today. I'm telling you. Come on, let's pray before we jump into this word. Would you bow your heads with me? It's going to be a long prayer. Um, God, you are awesome. Speak today. Amen. <laughs> On <laughs> there, Mark. A hey, quick little survey before we begin today. How many of you would say, just by a showing of hands, that you like to work out? You enjoy exercise. Can I see your hand if you like to work out? Wow, that is a lot of hands. Come on, this is a healthy church. <laughs> like to work out. Okay, you can put it down. 
How many would say by a showing of hands, you do not like to work out, you don't enjoy exercise? Let me see your hand. Come on, don't lie in church. Awesome, you can put it down. Uh, those of you who lifted up your hands the first time, the first time, saying that you like to work out, that you actually enjoy exercise, you are officially dismissed from this service, okay? <laughs> no, for real, you can leave. As a matter of fact, run home, okay? Because <laughs> I have now found some camaraderie and some commonality with the second group of people. Y'all are my people, okay? Come on, I will lift up both hands, both feet, tell the truth, and shame the devil, okay? I do not like to work out. There is absolutely nothing in me that finds enjoyment or pleasure in going to the gym. As a matter of fact, I am theologically and physiologically persuaded that having to work out was as a result of the fall of man. <laughs> yes, I'm very serious, people, because th there, were no, there were no gyms in Genesis, okay? <laughs> There were no ellipticals in the Garden of Eden, all right? You cannot have Pilates and have paradise. God, in his infinite wisdom, and in his omnipotent power, created all of us originally as perfectly perfect humans. Perfectly perfect. I, I believe Adam had biceps. He had triceps. He didn't have a one-pack. He had a six-pack. Uh, ladies, ladies, Eve had 0% body fat. 0%. Some of you are like, uh-uh, Robert, what's your scripture for that? I'll give you scripture. The Bible says, the Bible says, they were both naked and unashamed. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You only walk around naked if you got it going on. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> it was not, it was not until they took of the forbidden fruit that sin and calories entered into the world. So, don't like to work out. Don't like to work out. But I do work out. I do work out. I'm on an Orange Theory fitness kick right now. I do work out. And the reason I do what I hate is because of what I love, which is to eat, okay? I love to eat. I am a much better eater than I am a faster, okay? Don't hate on me. That's my spiritual gift. And whenever I go to the gym, hear me, I actually enjoy lifting weights. I love to lift. There's something manly about putting on Old Spice and lifting iron, okay? I like to lift. <laughs> But how many of you know lifting doesn't really burn the calories? It doesn't. You got to do cardio, which means you have to engage in an evil three-letter word called run. Ooh, church 1132, this is my issue, okay? I hate to run. I despise running, okay? I cannot articulate to you how much I hate to run. I hate that run runs with fun because there's nothing fun to me, to me about running, okay? Whenever I do run, I convince my mind I have asthma just so I can stop running, okay? So for me to get on the treadmill is a big deal. I got to have a lot of motivation, a Nike Just Do It t-shirt, and motivational music. I got the eye of a tiger. I need all that just to get on the treadmill. And once I get on, you know, I'll start at a good glacial pace, and I'll be gone. I'm like, oh, pff, this is easy. <laughs> this is awesome. I've been running for like, feels like 30 minutes. Then I'll stop and look at the screen, and it's like three minutes. I'm like, my asthma, I can't do this. I'm going to die today. So I've, uh, I've developed this move, and I'm letting out my secrets today. I've developed this move as a mechanism for motivation to keep running on the treadmill. True story. As I'm running on the treadmill, just wanting to quit and throw in the towel, I will first slowly look to the right. And then I will look to the left, and I will just peruse the aisle of other people who are running on their treadmills. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for somebody, anybody, a much older than me body. And once I found that random person, I will lock my eye in on that person and say something to them. Not out loud, but in my mind, real loud. I will say to them, psh, you don't want none. <laughs> now... <laughs> Let me explain what just happened when I said, Psh, you don't want none. When I said that, unbeknownst to that person, we just entered into a race. 
Oh, y'all gonna act like I'm the only one that does this, okay? Like, when I said that, this workout just got real, okay? As soon as I made that declaration, the entire gymnasium has now been transformed to the 2019 Olympics. And the first person to get off the treadmill is going home with the silver, and the one that stays on the longest is going home with the gold, and I'm gonna get the gold because I'm a child of God, plus I'm American. All we do is win, 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 no matter what. Come on, can I get a witness up in here today? <laughs> True story. True story. And, and it really helps. It really helps when the person is right next to me because then I can see their screen and see exactly how fast they're going. So it's even, you know what I'm saying? So if they're on level six, I'm on level six, point one. And uh, if they speed up, I'm going to speed up. If they go on an incline, I'm going to go on an incline. If they stop and take a break, I'm going to stop and take a break. Oh, yes, I I'm not going to keep running while they stop and take a break. That's cheating. You can't cheat in the Olympics. This is a global event. So whatever they do, I'll do, and then I'll wait for it. And as soon as they press stop and get off, I will speed mine up to the fastest level because you got to sprint to the finish line. Then I'll press stop, jump off, grab my towel, and shout, I got the gold, and rejoice in my sweet victory. I, I wish I was lying, but I'm being real with y'all today. As a matter of fact, I beat a guy uh, a couple of weeks ago. Beat him bad, too. And I saw him in the lobby of the hotel later, and I was like, hey, man, how are you? He said, I'm good. How are you? I said, I'm great. In fact, I'm golden, loser. It was <laughs> awesome. And uh, you laugh. You laugh because it's, it's funny, right? It's, it's comical when you talk about comparing yourself to other people in the gym, comparing yourself to other people when you're doing exercise. But how many of you know it is not so funny when you talk about comparing yourself to other people in life? And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, what I'm afraid today's message mandates is that you introspectively ask the critical question, who are you racing? Who are you racing? I'm just wondering who in your life have you set your eye on and you were running your race according to their pace instead of doing the thing that God has called you to do, instead of chasing after the purpose and the assignment that God has placed on your life, I just came to warn you today that the comparison game, oh, it's a dangerous game to play. I don't know whether you notice this or not when you're running on a treadmill, which is another reason why I hate running. Have you noticed on a treadmill you're doing a whole lot of running, a whole lot of moving, whole lot of sweat, but you ain't going anywhere. You're in the exact same position the entire time. What a beautiful metaphor for comparing yourself to other people. Because whenever you compare yourself to somebody else, all you end up doing is exerting a lot of psychological, emotional, and spiritual energy trying to keep up and compete with somebody you were never called or created to be. And at the end of all of it, you realize I'm in the exact same position I was when I first got started. I'm afraid I got more message than I got minutes today because I'm actually just exercising something a great mentor in my life told me that I'll never forget. He said, Robert, whenever you preach, just preach from your weakness because you'll never lack for material to preach. I'm preaching from my weakness today because I found in my own life, in my own life, as I'm running the race that God has set before me, I have this inner proclivity and tendency to start staring at the people in the lanes beside me. Hear me, I am convinced that comparison, comparison is the number one destroyer of destiny. I am convinced that the enemy's number one weapon of mass distraction and mass destruction is to get you to compare yourself to somebody else. It's his number one weapon because that's what got him kicked out of heaven. Satan, Lucifer, you know he used to be on the praise and worship team of heaven. It all started with comparison. He was created to be a conduit, to be an expression of God's glory, but he starts comparing himself to God and said, I will exalt my throne above the Most High, and that's what got him fired and dismissed, and now his job is to kill, steal, and destroy from you and I, and that's exactly what comparison will do. It will kill your joy. It will steal your peace. It will suffocate your sanity. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is like cancer to contentment. You cannot be content when you are comparing yourself to somebody else. You know, I love the Apostle Paul, the artist formerly known as Saul. 
It's funny to me. Anyway, he, uh, <laughs> he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And I love when he starts bringing order and structure to the church of Corinth because he feels the need to warn them emphatically about the dangers of comparison. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. Paul says this. He says, for we dare not, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Paul says, you are stupid. You are crazy. You are Foolish if you're playing the silly comparison game. And do you know why comparison is not wise? Hear my heart today. Because comparison will consistently cloud the clarity of God's call on your life. Ooh, that was so nice, I'm going to say it twice. <laughs> comparison will consistently cloud the clarity of God's call on your life. Meaning, if you ever want to be confused about what God has called you to do, then just start comparing yourself to what other people have been called to do. First of all, let's just establish today that there has been a call that has been placed on your life. Come on, I hope you know that at Church 1132 that there is a call on your life. There is a purpose for your life. You do know that Jesus did not come from heaven to earth, die on the cross, get up from the grave just so we could have cute church services and you sit on your blessed assurance and do nothing with your life. But there's actually a call on your life. There is a purpose for your life. Come on, if you got a pulse, that pulse is proof positive that God's not through with you yet. There's still something he has for you to do on this earth. Come on, you're not here by accident. You're here by God's divine providence because there's something that he has called you to do. I feel like preaching now. Come on, somebody say, I'm called. Oh, say it like you got some faith. Say, I'm called. Oh, you do know, you do know there's a difference between a career and a calling. A career is what you get paid to do. A calling is the thing you are made to do. Oh, it's the thing that when you do it, you go, oh, I was put on the earth to do this right here. There is a call on your life, not a random call, but a call that is so specific, a call that is so unique that only you can do the thing that God has put you on this earth to do. Come on, your mama can't do it, your daddy can't do it, your brother can't do it, your sister can't do it, your crazy cousin cannot do the thing that God has uniquely called you to do. Oh, it gets better. Watch this. God is all also already given you everything you need to accomplish your call. Oh, come on, to think about that, that everything you need, everything you need to do what God has called you to do, it's already in you. Everything I need to do what God has called me to do, it is already in me. That means you don't have to be jealous of anybody. You ain't got to hashtag hate on anybody in your life. Come on, if you don't have something, that means God and his wisdom and his sovereignty knew you didn't need that to do what he's called you to do. Oh, that's good news for somebody. Come on, that means if you were supposed to be taller, guess what? He would have made you taller. If you were supposed to be faster, he would have made you faster. If you were supposed to sing, he would have given you a voice. If you were supposed to be on Dancing with the Stars, he would have given you some more rhythm. Hello. If you were supposed to be black, he would have made you black. If you were supposed to be white, he would have made you white. If you were supposed to be Latino, buenos dias, he would have made you Latino. You got everything you need on the inside of you stop complaining to the master about the pieces you didn't get and just start praising him and thanking him that you're a masterpiece oh come on somebody you are a masterpiece can somebody just give God some praise and thank him for making you the way he made you Oh, see, some of y'all don't know how to shout over that. But I'm wondering, is there anybody in here that says, I'm thankful that God made me exactly the way he made me. I am wonderfully and fearfully made. God, thank you. Woo, hallelujah. For making me the way you made me. You are a masterpiece created by God. Who I feel like preaching. My right toe is tingling. Let me calm down a little bit. I need to interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon so you can engage in a verbal exercise. Would you just say this? Say, I, I am a masterpiece. Oh, say it like you believe that thing. Say, I, I am a masterpiece. Yes. Come on, say it like you got faith and power. Say, I, I am a masterpiece. 
I'm telling you, if that got in your heart and not just in your head, that will change the way you walk into a room. That will change the way you hold up your head to know that you are a masterpiece created by the greatest artist who is God. As a matter of fact, if you got radical faith, when you go to work or wherever you're going tomorrow, I dare you to take some velvet rope and just put it around you. And when people say, why you got that velvet rope around you? Say, oh, you didn't know? I'm a masterpiece. There was a God that created me. Picasso can't touch him. Leonardo da Vinci has nothing on God. I am his handiwork. Woo, I'm a masterpiece. Man, are y'all recording this? I'm going to watch it later. It is blessing me. It's encouraging to know I am a masterpiece created by the greatest artist who is God. Woo. Now, when I say you're a masterpiece, that is not feel-good phraseology. That is not preacher hype. That's not cute self-help talk. That is God's word. You don't believe me? Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. Look at what it says. For we are God's, oh, come on. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. That means God is a strategic God. He's already marked out a path and a lane for all of us to run in. And all you have to do, watch this. All you got to do is stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> All you got to do is stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. I just made faith and Christianity so simplistic. All you got to do <laughs> is stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. That's actually my entire message right there in that sentence. The rest is just fluff. I came all the way from DeSoto, Texas to Allen, Texas to tell you two things. Stay in your lane keep your eyes on Jesus. That's all I got. That is all I got. Literally all I got. Matter of fact, I'm done. God bless you. It's been so good being with you today. <laughs> I mean, that sounds so simple. That sounds so elementary. Some of y'all are very spiritual and you want something deeper. <laughs> you want something deeper in the word of God. But I'm beginning to find out, hear me, I'm in churches every weekend. I'm beginning to find out that right there is the most difficult thing for people to do. Just to stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus, that is difficult for people to do. Come on, let's just think practically today. How many of you have ever been stuck in traffic? Anybody ever been stuck in traffic? Isn't it funny in a phenomenon, whenever you are stuck in traffic, you always, always feel like the lanes beside you huh, are the ones that are moving faster. And what do you do? You almost wreck your car trying to get in somebody else's lane and you would have been better off just staying in your lane. Oh, God told me to tell you, don't wreck your life trying to get in somebody else's lane. Just stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. Ooh, your lane. Huh. Your lane. Huh. Your lane. Your lane. Your lane. God has given each one of us a lane if we could just stay in it with our eyes on him, we could run our race. Because the day, hear me, the day you start running your race like this, whoo, the day you start running your race like this, let me just prophesy to you, there is a crash in your future. <laughs> Selah. <laughs> no wonder, no wonder Saul has such a huge crash. Because comparison caused him to immediately to shift all of his focus, all of his energy on David. Now, make no doubt about it, there was a season in Saul's life, he was in his lane and he was running his own race. Oh, don't get it twisted now. Saul was the first king of Israel. He was anointed and appointed by God to be king. I love when the Bible starts talking about Saul because the Bible uses very picturesque language. It says that Saul looked like a king. It said that he stood a head and shoulders above any other person. In fact, the Bible says, the Bible said he was good looking. Come on, somebody. When the Bible says you're good looking, <laughs> can't nobody tell you you're ugly, okay? <laughs> nobody. You just tell them, read the word. You already know. <laughs> this selfie is for you. So <laughs> he looked like a king and he talked like a king and he had king swag and, and God just blessed him. God blessed him to be the king. But hear me, I found out even in my own life, you've got to be real careful with the blessing of God. Because if the brightness of the blessing ever blinds you to the blesser, it is no longer a blessing. It has become a curse. 
and the brightness of the blessing blinded Saul to the blesser, so much so he was more concerned with being the king than he was with worshiping the king of kings. He was more concerned with keeping his position than he was with chasing after God's presence. So God had to remove the kingship away from him. But there was this young little dude out on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and all he cared about was being in God's presence. Oh, he didn't care about a title. He didn't care about acknowledgement. He didn't care about likes on Instagram or retweets. He cared about being in the presence of God. Even after his own family alienated him and ostracized him and said, man, just go watch the stanky sheep. This dude is out there with the stanky sheep with his heart, just worshiping God. Until one day his dad sends him a text message and says, hey, can you go to the battlefield and bring your brother some ham and cheese sandwiches. And when he gets to the battlefield with the ham and cheese sandwiches, he sees a giant who is big enough to eat hay and dumb enough to enjoy it. And he says, wait a minute, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Oh, I love David. He's gangster because that's Christian cussing right there, okay? <laughs> that is classic Christian cussing. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He said, no, I ain't going to be quiet. Y'all going to let him him talk about my God in front of everybody oh no where's my slingshot I'm about to knock you out oh David said I'm not having it is there not a cause he said somebody let me know what do you get for knocking this giant out because I'm about to knock him out they said Dave you want to know what you're going to get for knocking him out you're going to get the king's daughter in marriage and you will never pay taxes again in your life David said what somebody hold my harp he said, you come at me with sword and spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord, the God of these armies whom you have defiled. This day I will cut off your head and feed your flesh to the wild beasts of the fields and the birds of the air. And today the world will know there is a God in Israel. Ooh, I love it. I love it. It's exactly how David sounded, by the way. 13 sounds like Darth Vader. Anyway. Come on, you know the story if you've been around church. He releases that rock from his slingshot, hits Goliath in the forehead. Goliath comes crashing to the ground. And the day Goliath hit that ground, David rose up. It was a destiny moment. You do know that all moments in your life are not created equal. But there are some destiny moments. There are some moments where everything shifts. There's some moments where you realize, I will never be the same after this. This was David's destiny moment. Think about this. In a moment, he was catapulted from obscurity into notoriety. In a moment, everybody knew David's name. They're talking about David, David, he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. I mean, kids are re-watching the fight on YouTube. Talking about, Mama, I got to get those David sneakers. They drop next week. You know they're going to be sold out. I mean, this is a big moment for David. He is finally arrived. He's on the cover of every magazine in Wheaties box with the slingshot. He's doing interviews on CNN, TBN, ABC, NBC, HIJK, Elemental P. The whole alphabet wants to talk to David now. Oh, everybody wants a selfie with David now. Because you understand, when he defeated Goliath, he became a rock star. Literally. <laughs> rock star. Church jokes, just trying to keep some of you awake. This is a big moment for David. He's finally arrived. He defeated the giant. He cut off his head. The wicked witch is dead. The game is over. The buzzard is sounded and the fat lady is finally sung. Only problem is Saul didn't like what the fat lady was singing. One of the fat lady, just a group of ladies. And here's what they sang. Here was their song. Hmm. See, I put that anyway. Um, Saul has killed his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. And when Saul heard that, he went from running his race like this to fixing his eyes on David. Therefore, Saul is a case study of the downward spiral of what comparison will always do to your life because comparison is always the beginning of the end. Okay, all of that, all of that was my introduction. <laughs> Y'all laughing, I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> I want to show you very quickly how Saul's speech, Saul's speech, what he says, teaches us today how comparison will slowly creep into your life. Notice what Saul says after the ladies sing their song. He goes, you credit David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands? Hold up, 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 hold up. 
Y'all are going to credit David, psh, little old David, with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands? You hear it? Hear how comparison starts? Comparison will always start with this phrase, but me. He, but me. He, but me. Saul cannot separate David's life from his life. He cannot separate David's success from his success. He immediately connects what's going on with David back to him. He, but me. Have you ever met a but me person? These are the people that see everything in life through the lens of but me. I call them but me people because no matter what's going on with somebody else, they will find a way to connect it back to them. That was too fun. I got to do that again. No matter what's going on with somebody else, they will find a way to connect it back to them because they're always thinking about them. I call them but me people. Okay, you need a visual and these lights are bright. I'm talking about... <laughs> People that see everything in life through the lens of but me. Now, if I fall off this stage, please don't laugh. Because I can't see anything right now because I am completely blinded by but me. And can I tell you, nothing will blind you to your purpose. Nothing will blind you to your destiny. Nothing will trip you up and run in your race like a but me attitude. Because how many of you know the focus of your life is not supposed to be on you. You're supposed to have your eyes so fixed on Jesus so you can run the race he set before you. Come on, if you'll get your eyes off of you, you can do what God's called you to do. Oh, come on, somebody give God some praise in here. Would you help me with those? That's what some of y'all need to do. Throw the butt me glasses down. But Saul's got on the butt me glasses. And when the focus of your life is on you, oh, that's when you know comparison has crept into your heart. And it's just the beginning of the end. How do you know if you started to put on the butt me glasses? How do you know? I think there's some blues clues. Three kids. Um, if, you can't, if you can't celebrate the successes of other people, you might have on the butt me glasses. If you are stingy with your compliments and you think to compliment or commend somebody else somehow takes something from you, you might have on the butt me glasses. If there is anybody in your life, anybody in your life, that secretly you would find joy or happiness in their failure, that's the person you're racing. And you got on the butt me glasses. It's quiet in the church today. <laughs> hey, can we be honest? Isn't it so easy to put the butt me glasses on? Come on, I'm preaching this to you because I had to preach it to me. It is so easy, especially in our culture today, this culture of social media. Oh, social media. Some of you get that tomorrow. Because you got so many devices, so many platforms, you can see what everybody has, what everybody's doing. Facebook, Facebook Live, Instagram, Instagram Live, Snapchat, Twitter. We are constantly inundated with everybody else's life. And if you're not careful, it will make you start to hate yours. Isn't it funny how awareness can accelerate discontentment? Can you imagine, can you imagine how happy and content you would be if you just didn't know? <laughs> but you got notifications on your smart device that's making you act stupid? Come on, you, you know, you know you were so happy with your vacation, weren't you? To Paris, Texas, <laughs> weren't you? You're like, whoo, turn up, it's gonna be a good vacation. We're going to Paris, Texas. You were so happy until you got on Facebook and saw one of your friends was going to for real Paris, France. Uh, but me, I want to be in Paris, Texas. Why do you put a Paris in Texas anyway? I want to be eating croissants in France. I hate my life. <laughs> but me, and it's so easy to put on the but me glasses. And please don't miss the message. I'm not hating on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. I'm not saying it's sin. I think it's awesome if you use it right. I'll be on it after this service. <laughs> How else will I know if you enjoyed the message? <sighs> Sometimes I wonder, sometimes I really wonder, I wonder what is creating. I wonder if the screens on our phones 
and our computers and our iPads have now become mirrors by which we constantly check for a reflection to see if we measure up to somebody else. And like a scene stolen from Snow White, we all silently echo the words of the Wicked Witch, who, by the way, check the mirror every day just to see mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Only today it's mirror, mirror on Facebook. Tell me how my life should look. Mirror, mirror on Instagram. Tell me who I really am. And we keep checking. Every second. Every free minute. All day, er day. Eat at lunch. In church. Preach, Robert. This is a good sermon. Just wonder what our lives would look like. Reflected on God's word. Maybe we can get in our lane and run the race he said before us. Look, I'll be honest with you, and I'm landing the plane. Thank you for that spiritual music playing behind me. But, uh, hey, I, I'll be honest. I, I'm not one of those preachers that can preach stuff out that God hadn't hit me upside the head with. And if I could be honest and just tell you really what was the whole catalyst and the whole impetus of this message. The not too distant past, I had this incredible opportunity to preach at this conference in Sydney, Australia. And at the time, it was my assignment to just preach to the youth and the young adults of this conference. I remember being so excited. I was like, whoo, I'm going to Australia. I'm about to preach Jesus and see some kangaroos. It's going to be a really good week. <laughs> and it was like some six or 7,000 young people that were gathering for this conference. And in conjunction with the youth and young adults having their conference, there's also what you could call like, I guess, the main stage part of the conference. And for main stage, some 30,000 people gather in an arena in Sydney for main stage. And the people they have preaching main stage are people who are really struggling uh, to get their ministries off of the ground. Uh, people like Bishop T.D. Jakes, and <laughs> Joyce Meyer, Rick Warren, Joe Osteen. I said, this is going to be awesome. I said, I'm going to preach to the youth and young adults and listen to these awesome men and women of God preach. And so I'm sitting there in that arena, kind of taking everything in, and my wife was there with me. And my wife and I knew something that the other 30,000 people didn't know yet. And that was just before coming to Australia to just preach to the youth and young adults. I received an invitation to preach main stage at that conference the next year. So I'm sitting in that arena and I'm looking around, I'm taking everything in. And all of a sudden, they show the promotional video for the next year's conference. And again, it's all these big names, huge, big names. Abraham Lincoln was one of the speakers <laughs> at the conference. <laughs> and then my little name comes up, and at the time, the pastor had to, like, qualify. He's like, I, there's one name you probably did not recognize on the list. <laughs> he said, it's Robert Madu, and he said, he'll be one of the youngest preachers we've ever had preach main stage. Then he pauses, true story, pauses and goes, and you know what? I think I might let you get a preview of his preaching on this stage in this arena this week. Now, that would have been cool. That would have been cool if I was not finding out in that moment with the other 30,000 people in the arena. Immediately, my heart went down into my foot. I start sweating. I see the pastor after the service. He goes, mate, did you hear my announcement? I said, yes, I did. I did. He goes, he goes, true story. I'm thinking tomorrow, after Bishop T.D. Jakes preaches... You could get up and preach for like 10 minutes as a preview for next year. He goes, what do you think about that? I went, yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> went to the hotel room that night. True story. Fell on the ground in the fetal position. Tears coming down my face. I can't do this. I can't do this. Why didn't tell me this now? He could have told me this a long time ago. I can't do this. You have one of those moments where you're so intimidated, your voice goes to Mickey Mouse range. <laughs> My wife, she's the best. She is the best. My wife is my CEO. She is my chief encouragement officer. And she said, babe, it's okay. You can do it. You can do it. I said, no, I can't. No, I can't. No, I can't. I never forget calling my dad up for some support. You know, my dad, he's from Nigeria. Uh, he came to America like Eddie Murphy in the movie. And <laughs> he met my mom, who's American. So, you know, when your dad's African and your mom's American, that makes you African-American. And that's what I am. And... 
call my Nigerian dad up for some support. I'll never forget what he said. He immediately said, son, you can do this. Before the foundation of the earth, God knew you would be there. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Don't be afraid. You can Wakanda forever, boy. You can do this. I'm just like, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't do the Wakanda part. He did everything else. He did everything else. I said, no, I can't. No, I can't. So nervous. So intimidated. Before I got on stage in that arena, I had a conversation that I often have with myself. I paused just for a moment. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who opened this door? Who opened this door? God did. Who did they ask to speak? Me. I can only be me. So I got up there for 10 minutes, I was me. But when I got off the stage and I was studying this passage, I felt like the Holy Spirit impressed upon me a critical question. The Holy Spirit said, Robert, would you like to know the real reason why you fell on the ground in the fetal position with tears coming down your face? I thought to myself, uh, no. <laughs> I know the real reason. There were 30,000 people in the arena. The Holy Spirit said, no, that's not the real reason. In fact, the real reason you felt that weight of intimidation is because when you were listening to all those other names preach, you weren't listening to the Word of God. You were comparing how they run their race to the way I've called you to run your race, and that's why you felt that weight of intimidation. So let that be the last time tears come down your face because you're playing the silly comparison game. And why don't you just rest in the fact that I have given you a grace to run your race. There is a grace for you to run your race. Somebody needs to hear that today. I said there is a grace for you to run your race. Oh, I got an announcement that I'm glad to make at church 1132. I hope it don't stop me from coming back. Can I confess? I am a horrible T.D. Jakes. I am the worst Joel Osteen you've ever seen in your life. I'm not a good Billy Graham. Y'all know I'm not a good Joyce Meyer. But there's one thing I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm the best Robert Madu you have ever seen in your entire life. Come on, somebody. I got to be me and you got to be you. This is your moment. Get in your lane. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Oh, somebody give him some praise in this place today and run your race. Hallelujah. Stop comparing yourself to other people. Fix your eyes on him.